Hello everyone, I'll just give it a couple of minutes to let people come in. Um, I hope you're all having a good day today. Okay, let's get started. So good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Steph Kershaw, I'm a research fellow at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use based at the University of Sydney and I'm also the project manager for Cracks in the Ice online toolkit and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we start the webinar, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. Today I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'd also like to further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are all on today as we are um, in a virtual meeting, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, and further, I extend that acknowledgement to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. Before I introduce today's speaker, I just wanted to let you know that as participants, you are in listen-only mode. And that means that we can't see or hear you, but you will notice that you have a Q&A button on your dashboard. And this is where you can type in any questions that you have during the webinar and send them through to us. And we will also be having um, a dedicated question and answer section at the end of today's presentation. We are recording today's session uh, and we'll make the recording as well as the slides available to you through the Cracks in the Ice website. So today's speaker is Dr. James Gooden. Dr. Gooden is a senior clinical neuropsychologist, clinical researcher and 2021 National Centre of Clinical Research on Emerging Drugs Scholar based at Turning Point Addiction Neuropsychology Service in Richmond, Victoria. Uh, he has extensive experience working with individuals experiencing a high degree of clinical complexity, including comorbid traumatic or acquired brain injury, alcohol and polysubstance use, mental health difficulty, complex trauma, forensic and psychosocial issues. He has a strong interest in the alcohol and drug field, as well as brain injury and adult neuropsychology fields, and maintains an ongoing research profile within the clinic and through affiliations with Monash University and NCRED. Uh, and we're delighted to have you join us today, uh, Dr. Gooden, and we're really looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for that acknowledgement of the country as well. I would like to also pay my respects to um, Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging uh, and recognising the country that we are uh, standing on and meeting on today. So today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, cognitive impairment in methamphetamine use um, and sort of our perspective in, in clinical practice and what the way we sort of work and sort of um, identify and monitor um, elements of cognitive functioning in these clinical cohorts. So I'd like to start with a classic referral question. So a client has difficulties with memory, query acquired brain injury due to methamphetamine use, please assess. And sometimes that's all we get. Um, now underlying this kind of referral question is this kind of assumption that it must be all the substances and sort of zeroing in on that assumption that um, methamphetamine or the other substance uh, is related to their, their cognitive difficulties and sort of to exclusion of all other factors. And I guess the first clinical reality is that as neuropsychologists, we're well aware that a vast majority of other factors can also influence cognitive functioning um, in all um, populations, particularly the drug and alcohol cohorts that we see. So um, ranging from factors such as sleep, nutrition, trauma, our mental health, how we're feeling on the day, uh, other substance use history, age, education, hormones. Uh, there's just such a vast array of factors that can um, adversely uh, impact uh, elements of cognitive functioning. And so our job as clinicians is to very carefully weigh up uh, um, all of these factors when we're seeing clients uh, with cognitive concerns and sort of working out what's relevant for that individual. Um, so in that context, we have to be quite careful around sort of those causal uh, attributions that we make. Um, and so what you'll notice in this talk today is I'll, I'll talk a lot about um, where things are at in terms of methamphetamine use and cognition and what sort of literature shows, but also try to ground that in that sort of clinical space that we work in at sort of our perspective. <clears throat> 
Um, so I'll cover a little bit about cognition and what we mean by cognitive functioning and cognitive domains and some elements of, of and signs of impairment. Uh, some of the issues that are sort of prevalent in the research uh, that's out there um, and as well talking a bit about where things are at with the methamphetamine use and cognition literature. And we'll find, f finish on some general strategies and recommendations and things that you can sort of hopefully take away and use as, to support um, clients, uh, friends, family who might be um, experiencing any difficulty. So first up, what do I mean by cognition? So this is a you know, very basic model of um, cognitive functioning and the role of, sort of different cognitive domains um, in, in human functioning. So you can think of it like a hierarchical model where we have our base ability, so basically our ability to pay attention and concentrate and take in information from our environment to work with and absorb and do something with. Then as that information basically gets processed by the brain, it basically gets processed in a series of more complicated ways uh, and more complicated domains. So for instance, we take in that information from our environment, then we might process that in terms of our visual spatial context, convert it into language and you know, communicate that. Uh, then sort of the more, more complex elements of being able to sort of learn and retain that information for later use. Um, and then at the top tier, we have our ability to generate goal-directed behavior using all of this information from these other domains and sort of um, processed information. So that top tier level of abilities are called our executive functioning skills uh, and are responsible for that goal-directed uh, behavior like planning, organizing, problem solving, and so on. Uh, and the key um, point on these, um, the side of things is that a deficit in one of these domains can also impact uh, functioning in other domains as well. So for instance, a weakness in say attention uh, could actually present as difficulties with learning and memory, for instance, because at that base level, a person might be struggling to take in information and that may make it seem like they're having a memory difficulty, but actually their weakness lies in the attentional functions. Uh, that limit their ability to absorb information in the first place. Similarly, if a person has difficulties at that executive functioning level in terms of being able to plan and problem solve, um, that's going to impact maybe their approach to learning and retaining information uh, or paying attention to their environment and interacting with their environment. That's one of the key things when we're thinking about in, cognitive, um, in terms of cognitive functioning is like a weakness in one of these domains can go look like a weakness in other domains as well. And again, part of our job is to tease out what might be going um, breaking down and why for, for those individuals. So what does it look like? So at that base level, uh, we're looking at things like speed of information processing, processing. So effectively, how quickly a person can process information. And a weakness in this area might look like things like uh, very slow response times, so you might be able to see the cogs turning for that person. It might take them a while to think things through and generate a response. And also they might be very easily overwhelmed with lots of information because effectively the world is traveling at 110 kilometers an hour, but they can only do 40. And so they're gonna miss information. They're gonna get overtaken uh, and can generally become uh, quite overwhelmed. Moving up the chain in terms of being able to process information and, and pay attention and hold information in mind. Um, so this might look like, um, you know, have someone having poor attention might be very easily distracted, unable to concentrate or maintain their focus for a period of time. Um, and what we call as working memory is often described by the general population as short term memory. Um, but in neuro the neuropsych world is called working memory. And this is basically how much information we can hold and attend to at any one time. Generally, it's quite space limited and time limited. So the rule of thumb is seven plus or minus two items in one's mind at any one time. And the idea is you take on a bit of information like the phone number, you do a bit of work with it, like typing it into your phone, and then you move on to the next task. You're not trying to remember that phone number for later use. You're basically just doing a little bit of temporary work with it. So lots of individuals kind of um, come to us reporting memory problems and say, oh, my short-term memory is terrible. And they're often referring to weaknesses in this domain. And that's because they're struggling to hold information in mind in that moment. 
So for instance, they might have difficulties with uh, keeping track of conversations or following along with TV plots or book plots, for instance. Uh, they might be misplacing items because um, they're not sort of focusing on where they're putting things or might be a bit sort of absent-minded in that process or have difficulties sort of calculating problems or solving problems in their mind, like you know, calculating change uh, or holding on to more than one step at a time. And someone once described this to me as, you know, it's a bit like holding on to sand, things just are, are falling through. When we move on to sort of more true memory deficits, um, this might be related to say damage in the temporal lobes of the brain where the brain now cannot um, learn and retain information over time. And so what this might look like is a person forgetting sort of really key important information um, right through to maybe forgetting full aspects of their history or what they've been up to in recent events. So they might be forgetting appointments, conversations, names, events, items, um, and so on. Um, and one of the really big red, red flags that we look for in the clinic is a very vague recall of recent events. So for instance, that person who just can't give you a rich history of anything that they've been up to, they can only really signpost you to a couple of very broad things. And they can't give you a really nice, rich amount of detail. Um, and again, what you can look for is that sort of remote memory. So memory for sort of past events like childhood events or sort of you know, young adulthood events being sort of much more preserved compared to that, those recent sort of memory events in the last few weeks, months, that sort of thing. And that's because somewhere along the line, there's been damage to the brain that um, leads to those memory structures not working as effectively. So from that point on, you're gonna to start to see, to see a degradation in that quality of their memory. Uh, we're also looking for things like the trajectory of changes. So has there been a sudden decline, you know, following say a head injury? Uh, or a more insidious or gradual decline. Uh, and the best example there, I'll say, in the cases of dementia, uh, where those brain structures are degrading over a long period of time, um, leading to sort of worse and worse memory performance. Um, so some things to think about is like how specific or vague is that memory um, difficulty? Uh, I often say if someone is um, able to give you a shopping list of all the things that they've forgotten in the last few months, um, that's actually indicative of a fairly good memory and probably more indicative of an attentional weakness uh, compared to the person who just can't tell you anything about what they've been up to in the last few months. As well, evaluate how important that information is that they're forgetting and how invested they are in it. Um, so is it really significant and they have to remember it and still, despite all supports and all strategies and all effort, they're still struggling? That's a bit telling. Uh, and does that extend into sort of all aspects of their life? Because if there's me true memory difficulties, it's going to fall down altogether, not just in specific elements um, that might be related to sort of their interest um, or, or things they have to do, for instance. At that top tier level, we can have difficulties with sort of aspects of executive functioning. Um, so this is effectively like the CEO of your brain. Um, and uh, you might have difficulties like a person um, being very concrete in their thinking or very rigid and inflexible. And despite best efforts, you can't sort of shift their thinking. Uh, they might have difficulty understanding or following along with new concepts uh, or unable to sort of reason with information uh, or, or deal with sort of abstracts or metaphors and things like that. Uh, and they might also be able to general, generalize and sort of think of creative solutions to different problems. A person might also be very disorganized, have poor planning or very chaotic, um, and, you know, constantly arriving late or missing appointments or unable to use or apply strategies, for instance. And this is also where we, where we might have difficulties with impulsivity or poor self-monitoring and lack of insight and sort of self-awareness as well. Uh, it's also important to recognize that executive functioning can also uh, present as difficulties with behaviors and emotions as well. Um, these are also mediated by the frontal lobes. So this might look like a reduced frustration tolerance, for instance, a person being very easily irritable or increasing anger, for instance, and having reduced emotional control or having changes in their emotion res emotional responsiveness. So being very flat or very elevated compared to what they were uh, or very egocentric, uh, egocentric and self-centered. And again, and then at that very extreme level, usually in the, in the sort of the de dementia realm, you can have sort of 
you know, a marked increase in, say, socially inappropriate behaviour, depending on what brain structures have been impacted. Okay, so in terms of, um, I'll cover a little bit about research uh, limitations now as well. So first up, when we're thinking about uh, the research that's shown in the, dr the drug and alcohol world, and specifically for methamphetamine, there are a couple of factors we really have to think about. Um, so the first is uh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And we know that there's a range of pre-morbid factors that are associated with cognitive outcomes just in the general population. So things like a person's level of education, uh, their trauma, their upbringing, and so on. Um, and, and these are really, really important factors to consider. And, and part of our role is to really weigh out the impact of, of those um, factors and how they might relate uh, clinically. But also we know that there's, there's some research that's also showed that some individuals might have um, predisposed cognitive weaknesses um, that may predispose them to substance use down the track as well. Um, and this might be related to sort of some weaknesses or, or, or differences in the aspects of the executive functioning, for instance, how they evaluate reward and things like that, or, or how they process and make decisions also. Um, so a lot of research uh, really struggles to account for these pre-morbid factors um, because a lot of research is cross-sectional and they're only looking at things in one point in time rather than long-term perspective research. And really the only way to properly look at this is by doing research that starts maybe in childhood all the way through to adulthood. But you can understand that that's in in inherently limited and, and very, very expensive and very, uh, very difficult to conduct. Um, the second factor as well is around sort of clinical comorbidity. And, we, and as I alluded to in the start of the talk, there's lots and lots of factors that can influence a cognitive functioning uh, in these groups. Um, so for instance, we know that uh, there's a high degree of psychiatric comorbidity in drug and alcohol groups, and particularly the methamphetamine group, um, with things like depression, anxiety, trauma, and so on. And all of these are relevant in terms of cognitive functioning. And often research studies aren't great at controlling or accounting for these factors. And if they're very good at accounting for these factors, uh, so maybe excluding for them, then it starts to raise the question of how representative is that sample that they're looking at to the wider population or those that are presenting to clinical services such as ours. In a similar vein, we have issues around sort of polysubstance use being the norm in these groups rather than the exception, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, so again, is it, maybe, is it if a study is investigating methamphetamine, uh, are they exploring differences related to methamphetamine or maybe past substance use as well? And again, if they control too well for that, we're starting to raise the question of, is this representative of the kinds of clients that we see? So you can start to see how messy things get when we start picking up some of these issues. And a really good example of this as well was published by um, Carl Hart in 2012. Uh, where he was really critical of some publications um, that have been out there highlighting that you know, methamphetamine was associated with cognitive impairment. And they showed that these conclusions um, or these studies highlighted group differences between healthy controls and the methamphetamine group um, at a statistical level. But actually they showed that the Carl uh, Hart noted that a lot of these um, scores for the methamphetamine group were still within the normal range for um, the general population in terms of their cognitive functioning. So they're not actually impaired at all. They were just statistically different between groups. Uh, so this idea that we have to do have to um, make comparisons to the normative data and what's normal for the general population and consider, you know, is this actually impaired or just maybe a bit different? Um, and so be mindful of how we interpret some research findings in that context as well. So having said that, I'll cover a little bit about methamphetamine and cognition and where things are at with the literature. And I guess the first main point is that there are an enormous amount of studies um, in, in this area. Uh, it's actually quite, quite overwhelming. And as I was prepping for this, um, I found myself getting increasingly overwhelmed trying to figure out what to, what to highlight and what not to highlight. And lots and lots of mixed findings as well. And just to give you a kind of run through of what it's been like in the last um, yeah, 20 years or so, um, there was a meta-analysis published by Scott and colleagues in 2007, highlighting that, meth that methamphetamine was associated with um, 
cognitive difficulties. Um, Carl Hart then published a very a quite scathing literature review highlighting uh, flaws with a lot of those past studies and really offering a counter view highlighting that uh, he really didn't think there were major concerns on that front. Uh, Dean and colleagues replied sort of arguing that, well, Carl Hart's paper wasn't a, a systematic review. Um, and then they conducted their own review uh, in a different series of um, uh, contexts as well and highlighted some difficulties. Uh, then there was another meta-analysis conducted by Potvin and colleagues more recently um, that also showed um, uh, large to moderate effects in aspects of cognitive functioning for those with methamphetamine use disorder. And they argued their findings were consistent with Scott and colleagues back in 2007. And I'll talk a bit more about this paper as well later. Uh, and then finally, we have Bassfield and colleagues uh, in 2019 who also conducted a meta-analysis but this time they limited it to uh, studies that had abstinence only. Um, so just an enormous array of studies and enormous array of sort of mixed findings. You can almost see sort of the way uh, authors have argued about this over many years as well. So a little bit about Popton's study. Um, so they collected a, a meta-analysis of 44 studies. So they looked at all uh, studies that had uh, clients who read methamphetamine methamphetamine use disorder versus healthy controls and they pulled all the data from those studies so that's what a meta-analysis basically is is pulling all of those studies across into one big paper um, so they noted that a lot of those studies didn't control well for abstinence mental health um, pre-morbid iq trauma family origin or uh, other substance use um, so that's sort of a, i guess first key point uh, and they found that the largest effects were uh, in reward and impulse related functions and social cognition. Uh, so large differences between groups on that front. Uh, and then there were medium effects in terms of other aspects of cognitive functioning, uh, including attention, executive function, verbal learning and memory and working memory. And they noted that their findings were consistent with Scott and colleagues in 2007. Uh, so that's for sort of participants with current methamphetamine use disorder. And one of the things they also noted from that study was that there was a publication bias identified. So they noted that um, basically this means that studies that showed a clear difference were more likely to be published versus those that maybe showed no difference. So they sort of again highlight that we have to be cautious in interpreting this literature here as well. Some two papers that I pulled out there are just um, of interest uh, in terms of being single papers uh, with some interesting findings. The first by Huckins and colleagues in 2021 last year or the other year. Uh, and they compared cognitive performance of act those with active methamphetamine use versus those in remission uh, versus healthy controls. Uh, so they found that um, there were no significant differences uh, in terms of cognitive functioning in those with the active use group versus the healthy controls. Um, and of note here, they excluded for a range of major, major medical conditions, uh, so anything neurological that might impact cognitive functioning, um, psychosis, mania, alcohol, other substance use. So the interesting point here is once we start taking out a lot of these other variables, potentially some of these differences between groups start to sort of dissipate a little bit. Um, then what was also interesting was that for those in remission, so I think they were average of sort of one month, between one month and six months um, of abstinence uh, compared to the healthy controls, um, they showed worse memory performance um, in that phase relative to the healthy control group. So this sort of speaks to this idea that things are probably going to get a little bit worse before they start to get better in terms of cognitive functioning. Um, so that's probably something to keep in mind for us uh, and just maybe be aware of uh, in that, those clinical settings or those sort of early detox and withdrawal phases as well. And then uh, an interesting paper by Dean and colleagues um, also looked at an active methamphetamine group versus controls. Uh, and they aim to try uh, address some of those issues around pre-morbid functioning and, and educational level, and they matched groups a bit better. And they also looked at academic transcripts uh, from um, childhood for those individuals in their groups. And I guess the first thing they found was that um, the, the academic transcripts for the methamphetamine group were worse compared to the healthy control group um, way back in childhood. 
which suggests maybe there is this sort of idea of maybe a pre pre-morbid weakness. Um, however, when I was going through that study as well, I did note that uh, the percentile um, sort of equivalent for those two groups was 48 percentile versus 58 percentile. So with the average, you know, most people are going to fall within that sort of roughly 50th percentile. So in actual fact, they're still fairly close to average when we look at normative data. So um, yeah, I was sort of interested in, in noting that sort of finding there. But they did sort of then predict what a person's cognitive functioning should look like based on their academic transcripts and compare groups on that basis. And they found that individuals in the methamphetamine group were performing worse at a cognitive level than what they should have based on their uh, predicted results uh, than that control group, which again suggests that maybe there's an acquired sort of deficit along the way. Now, they were also quite cautious in noting that it's maybe not necessarily methamphetamine, but that a lot of other factors also could be relevant here. So uh, they were careful in terms, of, in terms of attributing causality. Um, however, they did also acknowledge that um, the self-reported uh, self-reported methamphetamine dose uh, was associated with the cognitive uh, difficulties in that methamphetamine group. Uh, and they also did co try control for withdrawal effects too, because that methamphetamine group were tested around six to seven days uh, of abstinence as well. Um, so they did sort of try and measure, uh, limit as many of those variables as possible. Um, and then they also looked at um, cortical thickness, so through um, fMRI imaging. And they found that in the methamphetamine group, uh, cortical thickness, so of the, of the brain volume overall, was associated with memory performance. So in other words, those were sort of thinner or sort of less uh, brain volume. Uh, had worse memory performance than those with sort of um, more brain volume. However, there were no group differences between the methamphetamine group and healthy controls. Uh, and I would also note that these are all, in both of these studies, all fairly small groups. So between sort of 30 to 40 people. Uh, so again, we have to be quite careful around sort of how much weight we apply to some of these findings. But I did think these were two quite interesting papers in that regard. Uh, when we move into abstinence and recovery, um, so uh, two interesting studies highlighted that uh, abstinence from methamphetamine use was associated with increases in brain volume over time and also improved cognition and emotional distress at one year follow up. So in other words, we can expect with sustained abstinence, some improvements at a, a neurological brain volume level and also aspects of cognitive functioning. And the latter of those papers did highlight that there was a partial recovery uh, noted with most changes noted in terms of speed of processing and motor control as well. Um, and they had trends for significance, again, small group numbers. So they were only able to identify trends in other cognitive domains as well. So again, they had to be a little bit cautious. Um, but it does suggest we can expect some improvements over time. Another paper that we rely on a lot in the clinic uh, in terms of formulating our own clinical work uh, is the one by Basterfield and colleagues. And they specifically looked at studies that included, that looked at abstinence from methamphetamine use uh, with an average mean of around 120 day, uh, days of abstinence. And what they found is once we're looking at sort of a more sustained level of abstinence, um, there are only small to moderate group differences between uh, healthy controls and methamphetamine, past methamphetamine users in aspects of what we call frontostriatal dependent domains. So basically aspects of the frontal lobes uh, and cognitive domains underpinning that. So things like learning efficiency, comprehension, knowledge, retrieval fluency and processing speed as well. Um, so, and their sort of conclusion, which we, again, we really quite um, rely quite heavily on and I very much agree with their sentiments, was that strong statements regarding cognitive functioning in absent methamphetamine users are premature given that cross-sectional studies are unable to differentiate between cognitive weaknesses that may predate methamphetamine use from those that may be a function of methamphetamine use. Um, so I guess the pattern in these findings overall across sort of so many of these analyses sort of highlights that, um, yes, in that sort of acute and subacute phase, we're going to see some difficulties. Um, but once we start taking into account abstinence, the, the magnitude of these differences start to lessen and become sort of more in that small to moderate range. Uh, we then also included our own um, study into the mix um, just uh, to kind of explore what's happening in our clinic and what we were seeing as well. 
And we entitled this paper, maybe it's not meth, in recognition of um, our sort of clinical impressions of there being so many other factors that are relevant in our clinical formulations and not just methamphetamine use. Uh, so we looked at um, individuals who presented to our service over the last few years uh, with at least one year of daily or near daily methamphetamine use, and we had no other exclusion criteria applied. And then out of interest, we compared this to an alcohol group um, who reported no other um, regular substance use. And the only criteria we applied was that they had to have valid neuropsych test results on assessment. So this is what our methamphetamine group looked like when they were coming to our clinic. Um, they had, the majority had less than year, year 10 level of education or less. Um, psychiatric presentations and difficulties were very, very common. Uh, so depression, trauma, anxiety, and psychotic episodes, for instance, as well. Again, very, very common with the broader sort of drug and alcohol populations as well. There are a range of uh, neurodevelopmental factors, so things that they've um, been born with effectively, so things like ADHD or learning disability in a notable um, proportion of clients. Um, there are a range of neurological risk factors, including things like concussions uh, from multiple assaults and so on. Uh, through to your moderate or more severe traumatic brain injury, acquired brain injury, and also um, overdoses. Um, a notable proportion had untreated hep C. Again, if that's left too long, it can also impact cognitive function. And what was really interesting for me was, well, was that um, over 55% reported a history of daily alcohol use in the past. I had a mean level of 87 standard drinks per week, so around 12 drinks per day during the heaviest period of use. Now that in itself is well within our sort of general rules of thumb for sustaining or being at risk of sustaining an alcohol-related brain injury, depending on how level, how long they were drinking at that level for. So again, it speaks to this idea of are we looking at maybe a methamphetamine impairment or maybe a combined impairment from all of these factors, including things like alcohol, uh, which uh, there is a lot of really good evidence showing that it is quite clearly neurotoxic with a clear dose response relationship associated with how much a person drinks versus their brain and health. And again, polysubstance use was the norm in this group as well. Uh, when we compared the two groups, so the alcohol group versus our methamphetamine group in the clinic, uh, we found that that methamphetamine group were younger, male, and had an early age of onset for, of, of substance use. Um, more overdoses, hep C infection, and a family history. Um, and I guess my concern for this group maybe is that they uh, are presenting at a younger age. Um, so are they on a different trajectory to other substance use groups, or are they just coming to the attention of, of corrections or other services uh, due to this pattern, their patterns of behavior, um, involvement in, in offending, for instance, or just by virtue of the fact that uh, they're using an illicit substance versus uh, alcohol being a illicit substance. Uh, as I noted, polydrug use was the norm in this group, um, and there were equivalent rates of um, psychiatric neurodevelopment and acquired brain injury comorbidity between um, both groups. So it highlights that these aren't unique to a methamphetamine group. Um, these are broad issues across um, uh, the whole um, drug alcohol cohort, um, and particularly those presenting to our services for assessment due to cognitive difficulties. Uh, when we compared groups in terms of their cognitive fun um, functioning, we found that the alcohol group actually performed worse on measures of overall IQ, psychomotor tracking, and somatic verbal fluency, uh, which is generally what I would expect. I would expect that alcohol group to have performed a bit worse. Um, and both groups were largely in, in those low average ranges relative to the normative data. So we did, we, we yeah. Didn't make the mistake that Hart and colleagues were, were critical of. We, we did look at, at this relative to the normative um, populations and both groups were sort of shifted down a little bit. Uh, although there were some stop scores that still had a mean uh, within the average range as well. So uh, we're not talking about you know, vastly impaired uh, performances either. Uh, now, whichever way you spin it, I think the key thing as well to, to bear in mind is that um, Regardless of the underlying etiology for, for presentations of cognitive impairment, um, impairment can impact treatment outcomes. And this has been well documented in a range of studies over time. And there's been findings that you know, impairment can impact dropout rates, treatment compliance, treatment retention, and use during treatment as well. And within this, we know aspects of executive functioning are particularly implicated in this as well. So things like um, decision-making, reward evaluation, and so on. Um, 
And I guess another concern as well is that we, you know, as, as um, Betty and colleagues noted, that we there's there's an absence of um, pharmacotherapies for or, or treatments for methamphetamine use at the moment. So in the, the absence of those, we're really reliant on those psychosocial treatments. Uh, and these treatments are inherently language or, or verbal based, for instance. So if you think about that process of a talking based therapy, it requires a person to you know, be able to listen and track that conversation, hold it in mind, um, plan how they're gonna engage, respond appropriately. Um, and any deficits in verbal learning, working memory or literacy or attention, for instance, are likely to impact a person's ability to engage in those therapies. So that's where we do need to apply strategies and ensure that we are adjusting and accommodating uh, a person's weaknesses and using their strengths to, um, to support them through some of these processes as well. So I wanna finish up a little bit on uh, some key strategies that we often recommend for our clients um, and, and our general practitioners as well and clinicians. So first up on strategies, the first um, tip is we want to normalize strategy use um, for, for everyone. These strategies are for everyone. If you start breaking down what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to support yourself and kind of work or study or whatnot, if you think carefully about those strategies, you could probably generate a page for at least. Um, so when the client comes to you saying, I shouldn't need to use a diary, I shouldn't need to use my phone, I should just be able to remember it, um, please remind them that that's, it's entirely normal for us to use a range of these uh, strategies to help us function day to day. That said, they need to be individually tailored. So we need to use a person's strengths, find out what's worked for them in the past, what they like doing, what they don't like doing, and play to those strengths and adjust and build on that as you go. Uh, you might uh, hear sort of the use of so internal versus external um, strategies. Uh, and internal strategies are the ones that like use uh, repetition, staggered rehearsal, you know, mnemonics and story-based uh, mentalization strategies. Um, these are very difficult to apply, um, particularly for our cohorts. So we always recommend aiming for external strategies. Anything that basically takes it from a person's mind into somewhere external, like a page or a, a calendar or something like that. So they're not having to hold that information in mind. It's, effectively one less thing they need to try to keep track of. So for memory, uh, the more you work with information, the more likely you are to remember it. That's the general rule. Uh, so this is the basis of writing information down or studying and so on. Uh, and it's also the basis of those internal strategies. So the more you repeat something and practice it, the better you are able to remember it. Uh, so that process of writing down um, the appointment details onto a page or onto a reminder card and things like that, you're basically doing that work to improve uh, your, your attention and ability to remember it down the track. A key factor as well is that recognition was always easier than recall. Um, so this is where your know, prompts and cues can really aid a person's memory um, and it basically gives them a prompt on where to look for in their mind for that information. So again, calendar reminders, prompts, anything external that can give that prompt and reminder for them is very helpful. Another point is that forgetting is adaptive. We cannot and are not meant to remember everything. Um, and in particularly salient or very negative information is always gonna get priority over um, maybe sort of that sort of potentially positive some, uh, thing that might have occurred or, or someone. Um, so again, bear in mind if someone's you know, upset, or frustrated or anxious about you know, that little piece of information that they forgot a few weeks ago, um, that's potentially perfectly normal. Um, and, and particularly if it's not important or not super relevant or very novel, they may not be able to remember it. Uh, and that's, yeah, perfectly normal. In terms of compensatory strategies, uh, the key ones we often recommend are things like diaries, calendars, um, uh, using uh, phone reminders with SMS prompts um, or sort of notifications. And these can all be very helpful in terms of uh, helping someone take that information from their mind uh, and put it somewhere external to give them those prompts and reminders. Uh, for speed of thinking, uh, this is where pacing is important. So being very mindful of yourself as a, as a clinician um, or, or working with someone who might be uh, processing things at a different pace very actively dialing back your pace and accommodating uh, and working with them on that front. 
that you may need to adjust sessions accordingly uh, or encourage and the client, client um, can also be encouraged to ask people to slow down, clarify information or summarize information back just to ensure that they've got that information. And again, that they've worked with that information as well. Uh, for attention and working memory, one element to keep in mind for attention is fatigue management. If a person has weaknesses in their attention, they may actually be very capable of paying attention for a short period of time, but it's totally going to burn them out down the track. Um, so they might be able to focus for a while, but then they're going to crash and burn down uh, later. So being mindful of their levels of fatigue and building in rest breaks um, and consuming fatigue levels and adjusting appointments and appointment times around that to accommodate those, um, those levels uh, can also be very helpful. Um, for instance, in our neuropsych testing rooms, uh, we aim to minimize distractions, have quiet spaces, phones off. Um, so again, same rules if someone's trying to complete an important task. Um, be very mindful of that environmental space uh, to give them sort of the best means of, of processing that information. Uh, as I said before, writing information down, getting it onto a page, uh, or breaking tasks down to small uh, chunks and small bite-sized bits I can again reduce that tendency to force someone to become overwhelmed. And again, uh, diligently completing one task at a time can also be um, is a key recommendation there. Um, in terms of ex executive functioning, um, some strategies to help with that concrete thinking and rigidity is to adjust your language uh, and using simpler language, maybe link it once they know already or what's relevant in their day-to-day -day life, limiting the number of topics or issues discussed, um, so you're not having to kind of redirect all around, um, just aim, have a key agenda and one, one issue at a time potentially. Uh, and to practice though any new skills uh, in different situations to encourage that sort of generalization as well. Uh, for impulsivity, um, this is encouraging them to spend that time thinking about a task before they dive in. And that's a really mindful process that's probably going to take a lot of practice. So that's really that stop, think, do process of stopping before you do something, getting to think carefully about it, then initiating the task and avoiding rushing into things as well. Uh, Another one is around sort of initiation and planning and sort of applying that internal structure to day-to-day -day life. Um, and if you think about a lot of our clients, um, particularly maybe those who spent long times, a long amount of time in prison, is a good example of where some of these difficulties uh, can emerge. If you think about a prison or maybe an army context, for instance, uh, these are very structured environments where you're told where you have to be, what you have to do, how things have to be, uh, and so on. And that sort of structure is, is applied to you rather than you're applying it to your life. Then when a person comes out into the community, they've suddenly got to apply all of that structure themselves. And if this is an area of weakness, that's going to look like them struggling to figure out a daily routine, trying to figure out how they need to you know, organize themselves um, or plan problem solve, and so on. So you might need to work with your clients to apply and help generate that structure for them um, through things like generating good routines, having appointments on the same day at the same time, limiting choices and having really structured goals and plans around that as well. And again, breaking tasks down to small steps, having them sort of um, visualize so they can follow along with tasks or concepts as they go in sessions and having sort of key steps um, clearly documented as well. So that's a very rapid fire selection of sort of key strategies. Um, if you want more information on this and also just broadly cognitive impairment and drug and alcohol treatment, um, we've got our clinical resource available at the Turning Point website, uh, which is a bit of a practice guideline. So that's freely available for anyone who wants a copy. Um, and within that as well, there are the methamphetamine treatment guidelines also that are specific to uh, methamphetamine as well. So some key take home messages just as we finish up. So um, I really wanna emphasize that our client group faces a huge set of biopsychosocial challenges and all of these can be relevant to cognitive functioning. And one of the key elements, and I haven't really talked much about it today, but a lot of these factors are actually treatable or modifiable. So things like medications or emotional distress and things like that um, are treatable with the right level of multidisciplinary input. And that may yield improvements in aspects of their cognitive functioning. 
Other factors are going to predate substance use, things like education, upbringing, uh, or just general uh, individual weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses and aspects of cognitive functioning. Um, so it may be nothing that uh, that person has done wrong themselves. It may in fact be something they were uh, born with in the first place. And I think that's important to emphasize to some individuals who are you know, carrying that sort of layer of shame and, you know, uh, and stigma associated with, uh, with substance use. Um, and in many cases, they, they may, um, they may have been predisposed to elements uh, as well. Uh, for methamphetamine specifically, um, there will be acute and subacute effects on cognitive functioning, um, uh, but we know that cognition is going to improve with sustained abstinence, and it's going to be measured in sort of months and years as opposed to weeks. In the clinic here, we really uh, emphasize refining from labeling, um, especially if it's just based on a reported history without sort of formal assessments, and if there are multiple unmanaged factors, because again, some of these may in fact be treatable, um, and, and that's really important from a, a, a managing stigma perspective as well, from my perspective. Um, and lastly, regardless, consider use of strategies to support functioning and, and any observed impairments and really adjust and manage um, for, for your clients accordingly. So I want to acknowledge my many um, co-authors and colleagues in, in helping us um, develop this content and, and our publications to date, um, particularly Eastern Health and Turning Point and NCRIT as well. Um, and yeah, look forward to questions and discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, James. That was um, fantastic. We really, yeah, I think it really highlighted for me the amount of nuance and complexity in this field. Um, and sounds like there's still quite a little bit of work that we need to do to sort of solve that chicken versus the egg problem as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got some time for some questions now. Uh, so if you would like to put any questions, please do see through the Q&A button. Um, there's already some questions that have come through. The first one being, is there any evidence that certain groups of people are more vulnerable to cognitive impairment? Um, yeah, so that's where there's sort of a, there's a, a research body out there um, looking at um, those with sort of weaknesses or differences in aspects of their cognitive function in that sort of early um, age uh, that may predispose them to, to substance use down the track. Um, so there's some executive functioning skills um, that, yeah, can lead to that uh, or make the person maybe vulnerable to the effects of substance use and, and leading them on to, to more problematic use, for instance. Um, as well, I think uh, I mean, we know the contribution of trauma and sort of that upbringing and environment as well are very relevant factors uh, on that front too. So I think anyone sort of in, uh, in that sort of category might um, you need to be mindful of. And also those with some really neurodevelopmental difficulties. So um, they are you know, going to struggle in that educational environment and may not adapt well into you know, the school environment, which is very academic. Um, and I know a lot of our clients present to the clinic are typically more of that hands-on orientation. Um, they're not so academic. And, and so, yeah, for, for those kids, yeah, that school fit just isn't going to fit. Um, and we know that that, that may also... Um, depending on the upbringing and sort of exposure, that also may sort of be a relevant factor in sort of later life as well. Um, and kind of relatedly, do you do any screening for fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorder uh, when you're taking that kind of case history for people? Good question. Um, in our clinic, not so much, um, mainly because we're an adults-only clinic. So us getting that um, really maternal um, and even just early developmental history is inherently difficult and limited. Um, so that's probably yeah, more real in those pediatric groups where they've got access to or hopefully more access to that information. So for us, it's more of a practical issue. I'd love to include more, um, but it's yeah. that practical issue of being able to kind of get that history, yeah. Um, in terms of, um, are there any sort of early warning signs um, of possible decline in cognitive development in individuals that people could look out for? Um, yes, yeah, so that's more, more in that sort of pediatric realm. Um, so there's things like, you know, just general de uh, de global developmental delays. Um, so a person sort of maybe not um, speaking as early as other kids or having a delays in sort of um, their language abilities, or struggling at school, for instance. Um, we see a lot of clients that, with um, who, you know, reading difficulties that have sort of not been picked up on um, in, the, in earlier years. So, you know, that really sort of avoidance of reading or, or struggling to pick up um, those, those early skills um, compared to their peers or falling behind at school. 
and maybe behaviorally that might look like sort of acting out or being sort of you know the class clown and that sort of thing uh, in school to kind of get around that maybe um, anxiety and difficulty in engaging in that ac academic environment so um, that's where your early intervention and sort of uh, exploration of any sort of presenting difficulties um, is, is, is really appropriate. Uh, and there are lots of really good child and youth adolescent mental health teams uh, in the various catchments that specialize in that area. Um, admittedly, that's not my area of expertise. So uh, <laughs> it's sort of, we're doing it from looking back from, you know, the, in, in the adults that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um... You spoke around that they can be damaged to the brain, um, which can lead to sort of those cognitive impairments. Is that damage something that's actually visible in sort of any diagnostic tests like an MRI? Um, so I think that's what some of those studies were looking at as they were measuring um, cortical thickness um, compared to the, the healthy groups. Um, so of note, they didn't find that sort of difference in that particular study, um, I haven't looked more broadly into sort of some of those other structural um, fMRI or uh, imaging studies. Um, so yeah, I can't speak to sort of that breadth of, of, of literature out there, um, but it does suggest that there's sort of some subtle changes in, in, in cortical volume um, for, for those groups. Uh, I'd say it's probably, compared to alcohol, it's probably not as prominent as alcohol. And I think alcohol is the one real standout. There are really, really, really clear um, clear degradation in, in, in cortical volume and all the structures within the brain uh, and white matter integrity and so on um, with longstanding alcohol use. That's, that's very, very prominent on imaging. Um, and we, we just don't have that level of imaging for, for the methamphetamine uh, cohort, I think. Okay, great. Um... Well, maybe that's something we can hopefully see some further research in a bit down the line. Um, there's been a couple of questions around neurodegenerative disorders. So um, are people who use methamphetamine more likely to develop those neurodegenerative uh, disorders, even if they've been abstinent for some time? Good question. Um, I think for, and I can see there's one sort of specifically relating to, to Parkinson's disease. Um, there's, I think that link, that link is still very, very tentative at this point in time. We, we have sort of briefly looked look through that re research uh, in the past where I did sort of come across it. Um, so I don't think that link is, is super strong. There are a couple of um, studies out there that have showed sort of slight sort of um, uh, symptoms. Um, but the question is, does that lead to um, a full-blown sort of Parkinsonian sy syndrome down the track, I think is still quite unanswered at this point. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, it's hard to know, I guess, if there is a causal link, um, unless we have more evidence in that area at this stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone was wondering, um, one of your strategies was to talk about offering fewer choices. Um, when it comes to that, like how do you navigate offering few choices to support planning challenges um, while also ensuring that the person actually still has quite a bit of control and choice in their treatment and care? Oh, good question. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure I have the answer to that really. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess um, it's probably around breaking, it's, it's probably more around breaking that sort of um, those choices down. Um, so if there's sort of a big issue where maybe there's lots of choices that need to be made, maybe frame them in sort of particular contexts. Like, so for, okay, for this element, what do you want to do here? This or this. Uh, and then um, now then for this step, what do you want to do here? This or this. So maybe it's just around sort of breaking that up into sort of okay. very sort of structured um, and sort of compartmentalized way, maybe, and sort of dealing with one thing at a time. Um, rather so, not, than just saying, yeah. not, not necessarily yes no. less choices, but you yeah. know, specific, more specifying them to specific areas. Yeah, yeah, and just breaking it down. Yeah. Um, we have got still quite a few questions coming in. Um, someone was wondering about if there is any sort of medications to assist with the irritability or the anger that can sometimes come from, you know, that frustration of not being able to remember anything. Um, so that's probably beyond my expertise. Um, okay. So, yeah, I, I won't be um, able to make recommendations on specific medications. You can probably look at the methamphetamine treatment guidelines, um, which has that more medical layer to, to it. Uh, in terms of dealing with some of the symptoms, um, things like that as well. Yeah, okay, great. Um, 
There's a, another question just sort of at the moment, there's um, a lot of emphasis around the talking therapy, so cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and they're considered sort of effective for treating methamphetamine use disorder. Um, when we're thinking about this, um, is there sort of benefit to linking in with AOD so services to also incorporate cognitive functioning deficits as part of those treatment programs? I think, yeah, I think it is always worth thinking about cognitive functioning in, in those contexts um, and, and seeking the right sort of support input on that front to, to make sure that you're getting the most out of those, those talking-based therapies, for instance. Um, and that may even just be workshopping with the client on how they want to learn best, um, thinking sort of very, um, you know, creatively around how you're delivering that content um, and, and sort of, um, and that's going to be based on sort of almost clinical experience of what works, what doesn't, and how to kind of adapt uh, along the way. Um, and I think if there is any doubt, definitely reach out and, um, and seek support to kind of get uh, more information uh, on how best to support your client on that front. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is related, but it's kind of a little bit technical as well. Um, for clients that have an existing brain injury, are there any differences in treatment or those strategies to assess people um, if they're also co-using alcohol and other drugs? Oh, um, so if they if they already have a brain injury and then they're using yeah. substances on, on top of that, yes. any sort of treatment recommendations? Yes, or any sort of differences or strategies for that sort of population, I guess. Um, again, it's going to depend on that level of severity. Um, yeah. And it's going to depend on you know, what their, um, their common strengths and weaknesses are. So that's probably where they would, you would hope you would have some degree of an, a formal assessment um, for them to be able to understand and explore that further. Uh, and that, so for instance, that's where you know, a good neuropsychology assessment can really tease apart what their strengths and weaknesses are, um, maybe comment on what might be uh, acute or sort of um, a subacute effect, um, and then what uh, strategies can be sort of built and laid upon that to, to support them as well. Yeah, okay, great. Um, there's lots of technical questions coming through, um, but um, sadly, we only have time for yeah, about one more. Yeah. <laughs> so apologies to anyone who doesn't get their question answered please do feel free to email cracks in the ice and we can pass them along to Dr Gooden um, but for our final question um, it's just a little bit around that abstinence and what impact abstinence has on um, changes in the brain so you know is there any evidence around the length of um, abstinence period that it will um, what I guess is the length of abstinence period that you'll then see changes in the brain, um, whether it be cortical thickness or any others. Hmm. Um, so based on those sort of those, the few studies that we were looking at, um, we we're looking at least of, uh, I'd say in that sort of one year mark. Um, so yep. that's what that paper is really highlighting. It's that we, yeah, it's measured in that sort of the year process um, rather than sort of in that shorter time frame, uh, and even things might be worse in that sort of short term time frame. Um, and that's a, it just in general it goes the same with sort of any acquired brain injury uh, of any etiology is recovery is measured in years. Um, yeah. Sort of okay. Sustained years and sustained sort of change over time. So um, yeah, things it's it, we, we need to allow and so uh, a fair amount of time for things to um, to to recover on that front. So we probably need a nice long longitudinal study and we will bring you back in a couple of years time. <laughs> and that's yeah, that's part of the problem is that you know in practical terms, trying to measure that in you know a few months is just not you're not capturing, we don't have that data really from people who have been absent for three years um, and really well assessed at the start and then followed through properly. Like that, that level of evidence just unfortunately isn't there. So we can't really rely on it um, in, in the clinic as well, which is why you probably noticed me being a little bit cagey around sort of. Uh, how you know set in stone those deficit deficits are yeah. at this point we really don't know uh, and there's not much out there yeah there's definitely a lot of nuance in this area um, but thank you so much for your time and sharing um, the knowledge around this I think it's been really useful for everyone who's joined us today
Um, and again, apologies to anyone who didn't get their question answered. Um, please do feel free to get in touch with us via email and we'll do our best to respond to any questions or inquiries. Um, just to end with, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Um, and the recording will be made available on the Cracks in the Ice website. The Cracks in the Ice website also has a number of resources, including the amazing turning point guidelines that James mentioned. So uh, feel free to check it out. Thank you, everyone, and especially thank you, Dr. Gooden, for your time and expertise today. Thank you. Have a lovely day, everyone. Bye.